What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoArt video and in this one I'm going to be showing you how to build an awesome $1500 gaming PC build for 2023. I'll be running you through all the parts I chose in this video and why, showing you guys how to build this at home for yourself and looking at performance later, testing everything from Apex to Fortnite, Warzone 2 and many more. Let's do this! eBuyer are your one-stop shop for all your PC hardware needs and gaming setup upgrades here in the UK. With a vast array of PC hardware available, why not pick yourself up some more memory or a new CPU and GPU combo? Or alternatively, upgrade your gaming setup with a flashy new gaming monitor or some sharp new peripherals. You can find links to all the products mentioned in today's video at eBuyer in the description or browse their latest range of available deals. I'm going to start things off with a super quick whistle tour of all the parts I've selected and links as always to everything will be down below. Now this build is based around the Intel 13th gen platform so for the CPU I've picked up the i5 13600K. If you have some more money to spend and want a build that's a little bit better for content creation or streaming upgrade this to the i7 13700K. With this being an Intel build I've of course gone for a Z790 motherboard allowing us to overclock the i5 13600 Okay. This is the Tough Gaming Z790 Plus. It comes with Wi-Fi, supports cheaper DDR4 memory, and doesn't break the bank. Some Z790 motherboards are really expensive, and this isn't one of them, but still gives us that top tier performance. Onto the board, I'll be adding a 32 gigabyte kit of Gale Orion memory. RAM speeds for 13th gen don't matter quite as much, but if you can get a 3600 megahertz kit like this, it will stand you in good stead. If I'm being really honest with you, any decent DDR4 memory will work well so if there's a kit you like the look of more than this one feel free to swap it out. Storage will be provided by the Corsair MP600 GS. This is a Gen 4 NVMe drive that doesn't break the bank, doesn't clock in quite as high speed wise as like a Samsung 990 Pro but still gives us super fast boot speeds and four to five gigabytes per second on the read and write. Cooling will be provided by NZXT's Kraken X73. It's 360 mils, looks awesome and fits in with the NZXT NZXT theme perfectly. It's also going to provide us plenty of overclocking headroom which will be particularly useful if you swap out the CPU for the i7 but it works fine for both scenarios. The whole system will be built inside NZXT's H7 Flow. They also do an elite version which has glass panels but the mesh on this will give us better airflow, better temperatures and crucially better performance while power will be provided by the NZXT C750. This build is only going to chew up enough for a 750 watt power supply making an 8 50 or even a 1000 watt unit, pretty overkill. Save yourself the cash and pick up this NZXT C750 instead. Oh, and how could I forget the most important component of any gaming PC? This, the RTX 3070. Now the 3070 is a great mid-range GPU choice. AMD haven't really got much of a counter for this in terms of their alternative options at the moment. Though obviously keep your eyes peeled for future hardware releases as we head into 2023 as that might change. Detailed benchmarks for this will be provided later, but spoiler alert, 1440p in all the latest titles, it's A-OK. -okay. It even has legs for 4K. And those of you with a super high refresh rate, 300 hertz 1080p monitor will also to be satisfied through so a great mid-range all-rounder for a $1,500 build guide. So that's all of the components but now it's time to put it together and I will be showing you guys how to do it as we go so you can follow along for yourself. The first bits you'll need are the processor, the memory, the SSD and the motherboard. This is going to allow you to complete what we call the motherboard assembly. Inside the motherboard box, alongside the motherboard itself, you'll also find an integrated Wi-Fi antenna, that's this thing here, it magnets onto the case and screws into the back of the motherboard's rear I.O. Alongside a few other important documents, everything from the manual, which can be useful for figuring out things like RAM configs, to SATA cables for older SSDs and hard drives, and you'll also find these really small bags with M.2 screws. Keep a hold of these as they might come in handy later on. For now though you can discard your motherboard box just don't throw it away 
Whenever I chuck things, people take it very seriously and they get very angry at me in the comments, but it's okay. My New Year's resolution is gonna be to drop and chuck less things on camera. If you look closely on the CPU socket, that's this plastic square in the middle, you'll see there's a little triangle in the bottom left corner. This is what we're gonna use to line up the CPU, which also has a golden triangle of its own. Once these have been lined up, we're gonna pop the CPU into place, give it a bit of a wiggle, and add the socket cover back down. The black plastic will pop off, and like the motherboard box a moment ago, don't throw this away, as you may need to keep this should you ever sell or need to RMA the motherboard for any reason. Memory is next up, so we're just gonna pop the Giel Orion kit in. You'll notice on this board, we've got four RAM DIMM slots, but we'll only need to use the gray ones. The black ones are gonna be spares, and if you could pick up an identical kit of this memory later, I would recommend doing so, as that will allow you to have 64 gigs of memory in total. Overkill for gaming for now, but you never know, in a few years time, it's nice to have those upgrade paths available. You can also control the RGB on the DIMMs through the Asus Aura Sync software. Last thing then to pop onto the motherboard is the M.2 SSD drive. Take off the little M.2 heatsink just above the first PCI slot, slide the drive in at an angle and screw it into place. The top slot on this board has a really cool like toolless mechanism. It's a bit fiddly, but if you slide the drive in, then add the switch back into place, that keeps things nice and easy before returning the heat spreader down. Something which will naturally keep a lid on the temperatures of this NVMe drive. I'd always recommend calling a Gen 4 unit as they get a lot hotter than the Gen 3 counterparts that came before. With that into place, the motherboard assembly is nearly done, but not quite. There is one more thing to do, and that's add in some CPU cooler mounting hardware. Take this back plate and these male-to-male -male posts and add these around the processor. This is going to be easier to do now, as once the motherboard's into the case, things get a bit more tight and fiddly. So screw these in and keep the thumb screws to one side. I'm then able to go ahead and pop it into the case. Now, the H7 Flow, as I discussed earlier, is an awesome shout. And the crucial bits from a compatibility point of view are that it's a standard ATX Tower, which means it's going to fit the standard ATX motherboard here and it also obviously supports the length of graphics cards that we need accounting for any radiators. Once the case is out it's a simple case of stripping down all of the side panels. Now this case is not massive but it's also certainly not small as you can see from having to stand on my- I am quite short to be fair as much as I hate to admit it. Now this case easy to take apart because you just pull it there's no screws it's all completely toolless also same for the top look at that NZXT you are beauties he said as he fails to get this panel off. Yes. Only criticism I'd have is if you're using the case a lot and taking the panels off a lot, the fixings do lose a bit of tolerance. But for building a system and occasionally going in to clean it, upgrade components, you're going to be A-OK. -okay. Lay the motherboard tray of the case flat on a table to add the motherboard in as that will make your life a lot, lot easier. And make sure you've checked that all the standoffs and stuff are in the right locations. If you've gone for an ATX case like this and an ATX board like the Asus Z790 Tough, you won't have any problems. A cool feature of this board is that it has an integrated IO shield, which looks awesome and just helps to polish things off and make things a bit easier from a building point of view. Otherwise though, I'm going to go ahead and pop in the CPU cooler next up. Unlike the more pricey H7 Elite, you don't get any RGB fans in the front, you just get one crappy one a standard. So I'm going to pop the cooler in the front with the fans on this side and the radiator just behind. That's going to give us the advantage of more airflow, better aesthetics and fresh cool air from outside the case to cool down the processor via the radiator. You can also put one at the top or choose to move this one to the top if you desire as you also got 360 mils of uninterrupted clearance up there too. The cool is just going to sit on those four posts we popped in earlier with a drop of thermal paste and a few thumb screws to tighten it all down. Cables and wiring will be handled later on to get this thing all connected and powered up. For now though, the next stage of the build is installing the GPU. For the card, I've gone for the Asus Tough 3070 and as you can see, the box at least has seen better days. My New Year's resolution is going to be to drop and chuck less things on camera. It might seem weird to be featuring 30 series cards when obviously the 40 series is starting to roll out with the 4080, 4090 and rumoured release of the 4070 Ti. However, all of these cards so far have been so expensive that the 30 series lives on and the 3070 is a card where you can find some really, really great deals. What is worth doing is it's worth hovering the GPU over the top PCI slot. That's this grey one here. You'll notice that it fits A-OK. -okay. We've got 
plenty of clearance, which is good. 40 series cards compared to these are so big. This feels small by comparison. And that also highlights that there's a couple of rear PCI lanes that need removing. You'll see here, it's the second and third. Take these off and keep hold of the screws as you'll need them to fasten the GPU in. Click the card into place and screw it down. Power is gonna be sorted in a moment once we move on to the power supply. The power in this instance is gonna be provided by the C750, as I touched on earlier. The main thing to note here is that it's fully modular, meaning you only have to plug in the cables and wires you actually need. For now though, I'll pop a full cables and wiring guide in the card section so you can follow along for yourself. Before diving into the performance figures, you might be wondering, James, what's the best peripherals and monitor to pair up with a system like this? Well, we've built a full setup using this PC, courtesy of eBuy.com, using the MSI 323 CQR gaming monitor, an awesome 1440p 165Hz panel that is perfect for the RTX 3070, alongside the Asus ROG Delta Animate gaming headset, which has these cool LEDs on the side of the ear cup, the Asus ROG Gladius 3 gaming mouse which is one of my favorite gaming mice ever we'll link that below as well and the nzxt function tk out mechanical keyboard nzxt's keyboards are actually pretty decent and we've done four reviews of them over on the website these are a great set of peripherals though, and I'll link them down below, available over at ebuy.com. The perfect addition to a build like this to create an awesome gaming setup that's well matched with the components in this build. For now though, let's see how this thing looks when it's all powered up, and I'll rejoin you in a moment for the all important performance figures. and wider setup actually perform? Well, we've put it through its paces in a range of titles and we'll be covering off everything from the latest AAA releases to easier to run esports oriented games. Let's start off with Spider-Man Miles Morales, the latest Spider-Man PC release at 1440p, very high settings with DLSS enabled and set to performance mode. Here we pulled in 118 frames per second on average with strong 90 and 99th percentile results. But it's not just Spider-Man where the results were strong. Move through into War Zone 2.0 at 1440p, high settings with DLSS once again enabled and set to quality. DLSS 2 rather than DLSS 3 as you need a 40 series card for that. And 93 frames per second was the frame rate of the day. The 90th and 99th percentile results were also both well above the 60 FPS mark, ensuring a pretty competitive gaming experience. And for more than 100 FPS, you can drop down to 1080p. Call of Duty's Modern Warfare 2 campaign mode mode at 1440p high with DLSS once again set to quality was next up on our testing list with a solid result of 95 frames per second on average here. Fortnite at 1080p competitive also performed well, 282 frames per second on average. Competitive settings for those of you who aren't sure is where you tune everything down to low except the render distance which is set to high for the maximum frame rate performance. We also saw good results in other FPS battle royale games, Apex Legends 1440p high we got over over 150 FPS on average, 167 to be precise, with a very playable experience where the game looked absolutely amazing. Finally, to wrap things up, a bit of Overwatch 2, you can probably guess where this is going, an easier to run title, but at 1440p ultra settings, we pulled in 220 FPS on average. This build shows that you can buy something that's amazing for 1440p without having to shell out crazy money on the new RX 7000 and RTX 40 series of GPUs. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.